All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and let's turn to Acts chapter number 1. We're going to get away from our series uh, in Romans just one week. And I want to take a look at a very important uh, uh, thing tonight that uh, I know can be a help to us. And I wanna, we're going to take a look at here in Acts chapter 1. Uh, let's begin reading verse number 12. Acts 1 verse 12. And it's talking here about the... Uh, the disciples, uh, after they've seen Jesus uh, go up and, and ascend into heaven, back to his Father, and it says in verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem. And by the way, that's, that they're being obedient to what the Lord told them to do. That's where he told them to go. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were coming in, they went into an upper room uh, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphas, and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord. Did you get that? They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Um, look at chapter number 2 and verse number uh, 41. And this is after the day of Pentecost and the first folks here that come to know the Lord as their Savior from the preaching of Peter there. Peter preached the sermon on the day of Pentecost. And we see here in this first church it says in verse 41, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized and the same day were there were added unto them about 3,000 souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, we know that the foundation for the very first church of Jesus Christ was laid and established by the Lord Himself with his small group of disciples over in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 16. I'm not going to turn there tonight, but Matthew 16, verse 15 through 18. Is, you'll find it there. And Jesus said that he would build his church on the rock of what Peter confessed. Peter made a confession there. He said that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And today we still confess that as we preach the Gospel, don't we? Uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the only way to be saved is to believe the Gospel, believe uh, in His death, burial, and resurrection. And from the 11 genuine disciples that, that remained after the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, that first local church was established with about 120 followers of Christ. We just read that there in Acts chapter 1. And uh, they were assembled together in the upper room and then they were empowered by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and they were the ones with, uh, that uh, saw that great uh, influx of souls that came to know the Lord. Now in these last days leading up to the coming of the Lord, we need to look at that first church and I think we need to look at it and look at the things that made them great, look at the things that, uh, you know, could we, could we be doing anything any better? Uh, see if something's missing. Where, where's the evidence of those things that characterized the early church in such a way that it had such an enormous impact on society? Well, I personally believe that it boils down to one major thing, and that's the thing I want to talk about tonight, and that's the matter of commitment. Commitment. We see these folks were committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were committed to one another. Acts chapter 1, verse number 4 Look at Acts 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, talking about Jesus, uh, with, with the, His disciples, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith He, ye have heard 
of me. And then we saw there in verse 14, they did that very thing. You know, they were they continued right there in Jerusalem. They were, according to verse 12, they were uh, there in Jerusalem. They were in this upper room. And uh, they continued until uh, chapter number 2. Look at Acts 2 and verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You see that phrase being used? They were all with one accord in one place. They were committed to obeying the Savior, weren't they? And, uh, you know, in Luke chapter 24, in verse 49, the, the, the Lord said, told them there, said, I behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Well, we, you know, we've got to have a commitment to obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's just basic, right? <laughs> Duh. You know, we, we need to be committed to, well, what, what does the Lord want us to do? And let's, let's be uh, what we ought to be. Now, apart from the genuine commitment that arises from deep within our hearts, there is no way to be all that the Lord would have us to be. And when I speak of commitment, I'm not talking about commitment to programs or to organizations. I'm talking about a non-negotiable surrender to following Christ, Lordship of Christ, you might call it. Uh, where Christ calls the shots at the authority of Scripture. And our commitment to Christ's Lordship and His Word must supersede and govern all other commitments and involvements that we have in this life. Now, the Lord's desire is for us to have a deep-seated lifetime commitment to Him. When, when He saved you by His grace, uh, the Lord was not looking for you to get saved and just go on about your merry life and do do what you wanted to do. He wanted you to live for Him. Uh, he wants us to live for Him. Commitment to Him should be a once and for all decision in our life. He wanted a lifetime commitment to Him. And we just read that in Acts chapter 2, verse forty. Uh, 1 through 47 there uh, where those folks that got saved uh, they were being taught that thing and they were being shown that thing they, it says that they continued they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day were added unto them there's verse 41 about 3,000 souls and it says in verse 42 and they continued steadfastly um, continued means to be earnest towards uh, to, to persevere to be constantly diligent they were diligent about the things that are important uh, for a church. And uh, the, the first church is our, our example. And, uh, you know, I know we fall far short of it. And uh, we, we, what we need to do is we need to try to take a look and see uh, what's lacking in our lives. And, and let me just say, many are lacking in their commitment to live for the Lord. There in Acts 2, verse 40, uh, 42, where it says, They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Those, those are things that are important. You know, a lot of folks come to the Lord because of the prospects to going to hell just not really great. Uh, that worked for me, right? <laughs> I got saved because uh, I didn't want to go there. I remember on that Wednesday night, I was sitting in the very back of Sterling Baptist Church in Brunswick, Georgia, right back there about where Miss, uh, Miss, Miss Manning is sitting, uh, on the right-hand side of the church, on the very left-hand side of the view. That's where I was at. And God gripped my heart and showed me my need of salvation. And uh, I trusted in the Lord as my Savior, February 17th, 1971. Never regretted it a day since. So I'm glad I did that. And uh, But when the Lord Jesus Christ saved my eternal soul, there, his desire was for a lot more than just saving my soul. And that's true for your life too. He, he wanted so much more for you. Uh, he, he said that he came to give us life and came to give it to us more abundantly. Remember that? John 10.10. 10. Um, he wants us uh, to uh, walk with him. He, he wants to make a difference in our daily walk. He wants to live in us and through us uh, Jesus is our life. And He wants to be our life. He, he, he wants to direct our walk. And can I tell you that life is a lot better when we walk in obedience to the Lord? It just is. So th things go so much better for you um, uh, if you'll walk in obedience to Him. And may the Lord help us with the, the Bible exhortations to serve the Lord. 
I, I remember as uh, Jesus uh, spoke to uh, some folks who uh, were calling Him Lord, but they weren't following Him as, as Lord, as Lord. And He said in Luke Luke six forty six, "Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not th the things which I say?" I think sometimes we're guilty of that. We call Him Lord, but then we just kind of grab the reins of our own life. We grab the steering wheel. We want to steer. You know, we want to be in the driver's seat. And uh, the Lord wants us to move out of the way. Let Him. Uh, be in the position of control in our life. We've seen in our Sunday morning services and our journey through the Gospel of John the exhortations of the Lord Jesus Christ calling on those who follow Him to, to serve the Lord. And, uh, he, would, he beat no bones about that. He, he, that was something that uh, He wanted for those who followed Him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 the, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian Christians, he said, you're not your own, for you're a bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit with your gods. And that's what we should do. I and mean, we should be all about trying to glorify the Lord with our lives. And if there's something that doesn't glorify the Lord about our lives, we need to get rid of it. If there's something that needs to be added to our life in order to glorify the Lord, we need to add it. Amen? It's a matter of putting on and putting off. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, listen, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto the him which died for them and rose again. Now, we see these same type exhortations uh, to live unto the Lord in both these and and other epistles. Uh, you know, it was in the first and second Corinthians and other uh, epistles that were written to believers and other local churches. Sadly, though, many in church today uh, say they know the Lord and uh, you know they'll talk about the Lord in, in their life, but yet they are living lives that are not much different than the world and not much different than they lived before they got saved. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying they're living a life that is not intended for them to live. God wants us to live the Christ life. And uh, that's the simplest way I can put it. And uh, we, we are new creatures according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And we need, need to understand as new creatures, we, we're to have a, a new, new desires, new walk. Uh, he gives us those new, new desires in our heart and life. And as we get into the book and see uh, the way that He wants us to direct our lives, and we direct our lives in the way that He shows us, uh, hey, things go a lot better in our lives. It just really do. So many are lacking in their commitment to live for the Lord. Uh, second thing, many are lacking in their commitment to study the Word of the Lord. Here we see in Acts 2.42 that they, uh, they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine. Uh, they were uh, they needed that foundation. Can I tell you that we all need the foundation of the Word of God in our lives? I mean, uh, especially when you've just gotten saved, uh, a foundation of the Word of God is important. But listen, you never outgrow that need. I don't outgrow that need. I have to be in the book every day. And uh, you know, you say you preacher, yep, <laughs> I got to be there, and we, and we need to be there. Uh, Dwight L. Moody is often quoted as, as saying the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. And uh, that's a good quote. I mean, it's not scripture, but it's scripturally based. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, that, those are those are Bible verses, and, uh, and we we if we don't want to sin, if we want to live a life and be pleasing to the Lord uh, in our lives, uh, that uh, then we need to be in in the in the Bible. So, which way is it in your life? The Word of God will increase our faith. We touched on that a little bit this morning, if you remember, in our message. Uh, so then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God will increase our faith. And if you want to increase your faith. And boy, do we need that increase of faith. And we saw that this morning in these last days, things that are happening in this world. Uh, we need, and we need to be in the book. And uh, I'll just reemphasize that tonight like I did, did this morning. We need to be in the book more now than ever before. 
And so the Word of God will increase our faith. The Word of God will give assurance of salvation. Um, I'm, frankly, I'm surprised at the number of believers uh, who uh, lack assurance of their salvation. And I think it's because they're not living close to the Scriptures. John 5, 39, Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And John 3, 21, said, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, we ought not to be afraid to get in the Bible and have it correct us, have it reprove us. Uh, like, because when we're correct and we're reproved and we're brought back into the way, it's best for our life. Um, the Word of God will help us to be ready servants of the Lord. Uh, Paul told Timothy, Timothy, a young preacher, uh, pastoring the book of pastoring the church over in Ephesus at the time, and he wrote a couple of, of epistles there to him. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he told him, he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now he said, well, that's written to a preacher. Yeah, but we're all to be workmen. We all are to be workmen, not, not just the preacher. And so it, it's applicable. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, Paul told him all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I mean, do you want to be mature in the Lord? Do you, do you want to be uh, fully used of the Lord in the best possible way? Well, you're not going to do it apart from the Word of God. The Word of God is going to bring about that doctrine you need, the reproof, the correction, and the instruction in righteousness. Um, the Word of God will keep us from being led astray into error. That's another thing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of folks that are falling by the wayside today. You know that that was predicted? Yeah. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's regarding the end times, the times we live in. Well, how do you keep from doing that? Stay in the book. <laughs> Stay in the book. The Word of God will help keep us from being led astray into error. Act, listen to Acts 17, verse 11. And it talks about a church here. So these were more noble than, than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. In other words, they didn't just take a preacher's word on it. They got into the book and found out for themselves whether the preacher was saying right or not. And I think, uh, I think we would do a, a lot better in our lives if we would check up and make sure that uh, what we're being taught is biblical. Amen? I challenge you, even my preacher, you know, I'm, I'm just a man. I'm subject to error. I am. I take, oh, look, at the, look at the Word of God. You follow the book. Amen? You follow the Word of God. Um, another thing is the Word of God will keep us, uh, help keep us grounded, fruitful, and prosperous in the Lord. Uh, look at Psalm 1. Will Creek, I wasn't going to have you turn there, but I, I am going to have you turn. Uh, Psalm 1. And this talks about the blessed man. How many of you want to be blessed tonight? Amen. I, I like being blessed, don't you? Amen. We are blessed in the Lord. But you know, we love. I like the maximum possible blessings, don't you? Uh, look, look at Psalm 1. He said, Blessed is the man that walked in the, not in the counsel of the ungodly. Be careful who you, look, who you listen to, amen. And, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Be careful the way that you walk. Don't walk in the same way that sinners walk, you know. The, the, the picture here is like uh, the picture we had on the farm. Uh, I grew up on a small farm, and we had cows. And uh, those little cows, they walk the same path back and forth to the watering hole, and they wear a path. Well, if you take a look at sinners, they got a path that they go, and they wear that path out. You know you ought not to be in that path. Right. Ought not to be in that path. Ought not to be in the path of, of uh, and the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But he says, look here, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and here it says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What a, what a blessing. 
uh, in the Word of God here, we see how it keeps us grounded, fruitful, and prosperous in the Lord. So many are lacking in their study of the Word. Many are lacking in their commitment to the, the ordinances of the Lord. Uh, you know, sadly, uh, I meet uh, believers that never have been baptized, have never been baptized by immersion, never identified themselves with the Lord in that. You know, baptism doesn't save us, but baptism is important. It is. You know, we're, we're to be, we identify with Christ. Uh, there in Acts 2, verse 41 that we saw, uh, the first thing they did, then they that gladly received His word were baptized. That was first on the list. Before they ever got to sitting down and listening to doctrine, uh, they, they were baptized. They wanted to identify with Christ, and, and they did so. And, and uh, uh, we know that uh, they also were uh, uh, involved in the ordinances. I know uh, some want to say that the breaking of bread that's mentioned there in verse 42, that is, uh, they, were, they were eating, uh, eating meals. Well, that's probably, you know, they probably eat meals too, but I guarantee you they were involved in partaking in the Lord's table too. The Lord gave. Uh, the Lord's table, and you know, as often as you eat it, and we we, we try to do it about three or four times a year here uh, on a Sunday evening, and and uh, you, normally just you know not a whole lot of folks show up for it. But listen, we're to be we're not to be lacking in our commitment to the ordinances of the Lord, and He gave us two believers' baptism by immersion and the Lord's table. I mean, here lacking in their commitment to pray to the Lord. Now, this is this is important. This is big, and, and I see a lot of this today too. Uh, there in Acts chapter one, verse fourteen, did you notice uh, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren? Uh, all these all these disciples. And there was it says there in verse number fifteen, there was about one hundred and twenty of them that were together in that upper room. They continued with one accord in prayer. Uh, there in Acts 2, verse number 42, uh, they, they have continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So there's prayers that's mentioned there. Continue in prayer. Uh, Paul said, told the Colossian Christians in Colossians 4, 2, he said, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Romans 12, verse number 12, rejoicing in hope, Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Told the Romans to continue instant in prayer. He told Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 through 4. He says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We, we need to be involved in prayer, don't we? You know, we, um, this is an area, uh, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again and continue to be saying it, an uh, area where any believer can make a difference. If you're a believer, you know the Lord, and you can pray, you might not can do much, you might not have the ability to teach, you might not have the ability to do a lot of things, but I don't know if anybody can't pray. <laughs> You know, um, we are to pray. And so uh, may the Lord help us to, uh, to be quicker to pray uh, rather than ask folks to pray. I mean, it's okay to ask folks to pray, but don't, don't, let somebody, don't ask somebody to pray if you're not willing to pray too. Right. Amen? Uh, we, we, need, we need to have that same commitment. May the Lord help us if we're quicker to ask folks to pray than, than we... We, we pray ourselves when folks ask us to pray. I mean, God needs to help us in that. That, that, that don't be. Uh, so this is an area where any believer can make a difference. Um, number five thing here. Uh, many are lacking in their commitment to partner with the Lord. Partner. Uh, we're going to have fellowship tonight, a piece of fellowship after church. Now, that word fellowship that we use there, not the same word that's here in Scripture. All right? Yeah. We call it Fellowship. Uh, we're going to partner together and eat. Amen. I like that. You like that too. Uh, eating pizza makes it really good. Uh, but um, what does it mean uh, when it talks about fellowship in the Word of God? Well, the word fellowship means partnership. It means participation. Um, 
1 Corinthians 1 9 says, uh, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we see there in, in Acts chapter number 2, verse 42, there that they continued in not just doctrine, but fellowship. Amen. And, and that's not talking about that they were eating around the table, the breaking of bread, possibly. Uh, I'm sure they ate. If they, they were Baptists, so, you know, uh, they were Baptists because they got baptized, right? Okay, so, uh, so uh, they, but, but they believed in eating, and we believe in eating, amen? Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but but what, what this fellowship that they had was partnering together. And uh, 1 John 1, 3 says, and that, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye uh, may also may have fellowship with us. Partnership, John, Apostle John was talking about partnering with uh, him. And truly our fellowship is with Father, uh, the Father, and with His Son Jesus Christ. So we you know we're we're partnering with the Heavenly Father and with Christ, and you're partnering together with us. We got what does that make you partnering with? You're partnering with them, right? And you know, when you partner together with somebody who's partnering in that, uh, we're to have partnership in the gospel. Uh, only other place I'm gonna have you turn here. Look at uh, uh, Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. We see partnership in the gospel. In Philippians 1, and uh, let's take a look at verse number 3. Paul is speaking here to the church at Philippi, and he's talking about how he uh, thanks God for them. He's praying for them, and I look at verse 3. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making a request with joy, notice this, for your fellowship in the gospel. From the first day until now. They were partnering in the gospel from the first time that they got saved all the way to the time Paul was writing that. Now, and he specifically is talking about they partnered with him in the gospel. They were they had a part in his ministry and what, what a blessing that had to be uh, for him. But Galatians chapter 2 verse number 9 uh, says this, says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, uh, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So they partnered together to get the gospel out, some of them to get the gospel out to, to the Gentiles, some to get the gospel out unto the, the Jews. And so uh, they were partnering in the gospel. What about partnership in ministering to the saints? Um, you know, that word partaker is uh, uh, used sometimes in Scripture. That means a co-participant. We're to, we're to part, be partakers. Uh, sharing a material substance. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we uh, would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The partnering together of ministering to the saints. Romans 15, 26, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. They're, those folks in Macedonia and Achaia gave because there was a need over at the Church of Jerusalem. They were suffering because of persecution. And they were a poor church. Uh, they were the first church. If it hadn't been for the church at Jerusalem, the church at Macedonia and Achaia would have never came to existence. Jerusalem was first, spread out, but they were suffering under that persecution that they were under. And, but the, 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 uh, those folks in Macedonia and the KI sent a contribution so they could partner together with them. Um, but not only is sharing material substance, but also sharing of spiritual substance. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2 uh, Paul told Timothy, Thou therefore, be, uh, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You know, we're, we're to partner together in the ministry. We, you know, we're, uh, you're to be taught and then you're to use that teaching to help teach others. But are you, is anybody learning anything from you? You know? Uh, I hope that you think that you're learning something from me. Amen. Uh, I, I work hard to, to teach and preach God's Word. And uh, I don't uh, complain about that. I, I love what I do. Amen. And But the Lord intends for 
all of us to, to partner together to get things done. Uh, partnership in the sufferings of Christ. Paul talked about that in Philippians 3.10. He says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Now, nobody really likes sufferings. I know that. But we are to partner together uh, with the Lord if it need be. Uh, if we're called to suffer for his, on His account, we're to be willing to do that. Um, and number six thing that uh, we want to see here. Many are lacking in their commitment to fellowship with the saints. There in Acts chapter 2, verse number of, of 42, they, uh, they, they were there. Uh, you could see they were with the other saints there. Verse 46, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Uh, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Uh, they were, they were uh, committed to uh, having the kind of fellowship we like to talk about. Amen. And uh, so, praise the Lord. I, in, in the assembly, uh, we, we're to be uh, gathering together as we gather together. Hebrews 10, verse 24-25. Let us consider one another to provoke into good love and good works. You don't usually hear the word provoke used with love and good works, but that's how we're to provoke one another. Uh, toward love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. But you know, as the day of the Lord's coming is approaching, you know what I'm saying? Faithfulness going down. It ought not to be. I know it gets quiet whenever a preacher says that, but it ought not to be. It ought to be it ought to be the assembling together and exhorting one another. And we ought to be doing that more and more until the Lord comes back. Um, we talk, done talked about the Lord's table, um, and fellowship meals also. I mean, you know, they were they were they were eating bread there from house to house. To, uh, they they were they were they were eating, amen. And that's okay too. But listen, all this thing that I'm, that I'm talking about, commitment. Uh, it, we we need to to have commitment in our life. As we look in the uh, servants of old. Before the church. You know, commitment was needed back then too. Uh, think about Joseph. Joseph was committed to the Lord. And so each step of the way through difficult circumstances, he showed through his life that the Lord was with him. Because of his faithfulness and his commitment to the Lord, he was exalted. Uh, he went from being tossed in a hole in the ground and then being sold into slavery at the hands of his brothers to being a slave in Potiphar's house to being a prisoner who was unjustly imprisoned, to second in command in Egypt, yet every step of the way he remained committed to the Lord and the, the Lord was with him each step of the way. And the Lord is one that exalted him to number two man in Egypt where he basically saved a lot of lives, including his family that would eventually come to be there with him. Daniel was also a man who was committed to the Lord. I mean, he was jerked up from his house uh, in Judah and carried away into Babylon. Uh, we're dealing with that on Wednesday nights. Uh, that, that, that particular time when he was carried into captivity along with a lot of other folks in Judah. And uh, they were carried there, but Daniel purposed in his heart to obey the Lord even as captive in a pagan land. And the Lord blessed him, and the Lord exalted him, and the Lord protected him. Amen. Where did that come from? It came from commitment. His commitment to the Lord. As he committed to the Lord, the Lord was committed to him. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know them as the three Hebrew children. They were committed to the Lord and determined not to bow down to an idol, even if it cost them their lives. And the Lord was with them in the fire and brought them through the fire unscathed. Hmm? Uh, Paul, in the New Testament, was willing to be shipwrecked, beaten, falsely accused throughout his entire earthly ministry, all because of his commitment to the Lord. Let me leave you with three things real quick. <clears throat> three things. Commitment is a conscious choice. It's a conscious choice. Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Okay. It's a choice. You're going to serve something, somebody. Either serving, you could be serving yourself. You might be serving the devil. 
You might be serving somebody else, but the Lord wants you to serve Him. Serve Him. Choose you this day whom you will serve. 1 Kings 18, 21. Elijah came to all, unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If, if the Lord be God, follow Him. But if they'll follow Him. Who's your Lord? You know, who's the one that you call Lord? Well, follow Him. Amen? If, if He's not Lord, um, you know, but He is Lord. <laughs> we know He's Lord. So, commitment's a conscious choice. Second, commitment is a complete choice. Uh, we can't hold on to something else and say that we're truly committed. Committed is, I'm all in. <laughs> all in. We need to be just like Elisha. Uh, Elisha was all in. He burned his plows behind him. <laughs> said, not going to go back to being a plow boy. He was a plow boy whenever Elijah found him. And um, when he was called, he, uh, he burned his instruments and uh, he killed his oxen. <laughs> and he, he uh, divided it up. I mean, you know, they, the, he was committed. You know, there was no going back, there no turning back. We need to be like Elisha. Uh, commitment is a complete choice. Commitment is a continuing choice. Our once and for all surrender to the Lord must be activated and appropriated daily. But it's the initial total commitment that forms the basis for that subsequent obedience. Now, it's important to have that initial commitment and then stick with it. A daily, uh, a daily commitment. Um, let me put it this way. I'm going to say this slowly, okay? A complete lifetime surrender to Jesus allows His full, abundant, supernatural life to be released in us and sets us free from the power of temptation, sin, and self. I'm going to say it again. A complete lifetime surrender to Jesus allows His full, abundant, supernatural life to be released in us and sets us free from the power of temptation, sin, and self. Amen. Well, that's what I have for you tonight. Are you committed to the Lord? Number one, are you saved? You know, that's where it begins when you can know the Lord as your Savior. If you're not saved tonight, come. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Trust Him as your Savior. And then commit your life to Him. Say, Lim, okay, Jesus, I'm yours. You know, you show me what you want me to do. I'm your willing, willing servant, and He will certainly show you. Um, but may the Lord help us in these last days, not slacking on our commitment to Him. If anything, we need to be more committed now, because it's going to be so much easier to for us to just push away from the things with what we see coming on the horizon. Don't be that way. Uh, stick strong in your commitment to the Lord. Let's pray, Father.